Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you our hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and so worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior Jesus Christ, and proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation, that we and the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works, who with you reigns and the whole one God with the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. We can be seated for the lessons. A lesson from Nehemiah. All the people of Israel gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men, <clears throat> men and women and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read, it from it, he read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation. They gave this sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, 
And the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord and do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The word of the Lord.
A reading from Corinthians. <clears throat> Just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were made, made to drink in one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again to the head or to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater glory to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body. But the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then deeds of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. And then he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And then he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts ever be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Today, in the Gospel of Luke, we hear what is essentially Jesus' inaugural address. He speaks to the people in the synagogue and is telling them what he is going to do. It is setting his agenda, setting his mission forth. Now, we've heard this before. We hear it all the time. But I'd like us to think a little bit more deeply about what is going on here. When we hear Jesus speak these words in hindsight, we say, well, of course, this is what Jesus did. But what exactly was it he was to do? And what does it mean for us? Jesus goes to the synagogue, it says, as was his habit, his custom. He was a good Jewish boy. He went to synagogue like we go to church. And so there he was on the Sabbath day in Nazareth. Nazareth of all places. Nazareth where he was brought up. Now, the towns in Palestine, we've said this before also, were not terribly large and Nazareth was no exception. In fact, Nazareth was on the smallish side. I was raised in such a place. I've told you that before too. And in particular, I was raised in a little ethnic enclave. And so it was, I remember saying last week when we talked about the wedding in Cana, how when I was ordained and my family put on a, a party, a banquet, in celebration, we had to basically invite the whole parish. Because everybody was either related to us one way or another, or they were close friends of the family, and certainly we wanted to leave no one out, because they may take offense if we did. So there they all were. And uh, several weeks later, I don't remember exactly what the reason was, but I came back, came back to my little town, to my little parish. And at that point, people had a chance to speak with me privately, not so much the way it is in a big reception where, you know, you don't have very much time to spend with anybody in particular. And there were a few of the older members of our congregation, of our parish, particularly women, who would say to me, we're so proud of you that you're ordained a priest now. You've worked so hard and it's great. We're so happy for you. We're so proud of you. And they would say this over and over again, person after person. And then all of a sudden, one of them said to me, and it was a humbling moment, we're so proud that you're ordained a priest. You'll be a pastor. You'll be a leader. Oh, I remember when I changed your diapers. Now, if you need a moment of humility, there's one. 
Here you are in full regalia, collar and vestments and all that sort of thing, and then you're looking at someone who saw you in your innocent altogether. They saw you, they knew you well. They knew Jesus this way too. This is Jesus' hometown. This is Jesus' home parish, as it were. And it is there that he chose to begin his public ministry by making this announcement, by standing up, doing what was done in synagogues at that time, and the attendant came over and handed him the scroll of the prophet. And Jesus unrolls it and finds this particular passage. So this meant that it wasn't just by luck or assignment of the lectionary, as it were, that this was the lesson for the day. No, this is something he chose to read. And so he reads it, and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Oh, yeah, we understand that about Jesus. But the people who knew him best did not. They knew him as the kid down the street. They knew him as the teenager. They knew him as the apprentice to his father. They knew him, maybe they even changed his diapers. And while we look at this and we say, yes, of course, the people listening to Jesus the first time saying this, these words meant something very different to them. Because you see, in the days of Jesus, only, only the kings were anointed with oil. Recall the story of the anointing of David that we heard a bit back, where all of his brothers were, per were paraded in front of Samuel the prophet, and God whispered into Samuel's ear, no, not this one, no, not this one, no, not this one. None of the seven that were paraded in front of him were suitable. And they finally sent for David, who was out tending the sheep. And he arrives, and Samuel says, this is the chosen of the Lord. And he takes out his horn of oil and anoints David king. And the more modern version of that, if you, those of you who are aficionados of the series The Crown may recall an episode toward the beginning of the series where the coronation of Queen Elizabeth was the subject. And as they're going through the coronation service, there comes a moment where she is anointed by the Archbishop. And you may recall that the commentary that was given in order to explain this scene was given by none other than Edward VIII, the one who abdicated the throne, was never anointed king. And he's explaining it to his coterie, sitting around him in his, room, his rooms in France. As they're watching this on television, the first time that this was televised, and all of a sudden, when it comes to the moment of the anointing, the screen changes. They're not showing that part on television. And of course, the people there, you can hear American accents, so they're really sort of used to seeing everything on TV. And they said, well, how come they turned away? And Edward said, this is the most sacred moment in the entire ceremony. Not the placing of the crown or any of that, but the anointing. And he goes on to say that the reason it is so sacred is that once the holy oil touches the person being anointed, they are forever changed. They are transformed. They are no longer themselves. Now they are king or queen. And all the responsibilities that go with that are now there. We call it the coronation. Perhaps we might better call it the anointing. And that's what Jesus is saying as he said, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He's not talking about David being anointed king so many years, centuries actually before. No, he's saying, here, me, I'm it. The Lord, the spirit has descended on me for he has anointed me. There was no such thing. Jesus was never anointed with oil. Not in the way David was, or the kings that followed David, nor even our modern monarchs. 
No, he was anointed of the Holy Spirit, he is saying. And the reason he was anointed was to do these things, to bring good news to the poor, release to captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim a year of the Lord's favor. Now that is actually the key. Because that year of the Lord's favor, that sounds like a rather nice phrase, but in, to Jewish ears, in the time of Jesus, this was a very specific thing. For in the Torah, in the law of Moses, there is a provision set forth that says every 50th year is to be proclaimed a year of jubilee, a year of the Lord's favor. The jubilee year. And the purpose of the jubilee year was to, in essence, push the cosmic reset button to put everything back to the way it was supposed to be. And it had some very practical implications. For when a year of jubilee was proclaimed, all debts were forgiven. When the year of jubilee was proclaimed, all properties, all lands were returned to their ancestral owners. Even if now you held title to that property, you had to give it back to its ancestral owner's family. Yeah, everything went back. It was reset. Now, if you go out 422, and you go into Cleona, and you turn up Church Street, no, not Church, yeah, Center Street, Center Street at the light, you go up over a bridge, over the over the railroad, and off to the right is a big field, a big agricultural field. And now that there's nothing really high growing in it, look at it carefully the next time you might be out there, and you will notice a small little square of land that has a fence around it, and you will notice inside that square, tombstones. Back in the day, even in our own country, in our own culture, people were buried on their land. In the time of Jesus, there were no cemeteries as we know them. You were buried on your ancestral lands. And so for someone to take title to the land which was your ancestral home, where your ancestors were all buried, was to cut you off. You no longer had the land itself to produce food for your family. You no longer had the land itself to produce grain that you could mill into flour and then the sell in the marketplace so that you could have money for other things that your family and you might need for a trade or whatever it was. Taking the land away or giving it away was actually doing that. It was cutting you off from your economic source. It was cutting you off from your life source. It was cutting you off from your ancestors. It was taking away your identity. And it is for this reason that God determined in the law of Moses that on the 50th year, it was all supposed to be restored. The giant reset button. Bring it all back to the way it should have been. So all of those things that precede that, release of captives, Freedom to prisoners. You know, prisoners were not prisoners like today. There were no such things as penitentiaries as we know them, correctional facilities, whatever we call them. The, just about the only thing you were thrown into prison for was for debts because you owed money and you couldn't pay it back. And so you were put into prison so that your family had the motive to pay back the money. That way you were ransomed. You were redeemed. Does that word sound familiar? and you would find your freedom again. These are the things that only the king can do. It's in the king's authority to command that debts be forgiven. It's the king's authority to command that people are released from captivity, that slaves are given their freedom. It is the king's authority that does that. And Jesus is saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to do this, to bring this good news. In this, 
prophecy is now fulfilled in your hearing. This is me. Well, Luke observes in the text, the eyes of all there were fixed upon him. Now, if Jesus were standing here, our eyes would be fixed on him too. I am sure of it, but for very different reasons. You know, they're fixed on him because he is saying something that is totally crazy. Totally un unacceptable to them. They knew him after all. They saw him grow up. And maybe we need to listen to the spoiler alert. Next year's or next week's gospel lesson. It says that these same people who were listening to Jesus and seemed to be transfixed by his speaking rose up against him, carried him to the end of town, and they wanted to throw him off the cliff. That's how upset they were with him. Jesus evaded that. But we know that in the end, this kind of talk did him in. It was finally what brought him to his end, that ignominious end on the cross. It was this kind of talk. Who of us would want to hear someone announce a year of jubilee where if anybody owed us any money, we had to forgive their debts. If we had property that we had purchased with our hard-earned money, but it actually belonged ancestrally to someone else, we'd have to give it back to them. Not sell it, give it. We wouldn't like that very much. In fact, scholars tell us that there's no real evidence that this was ever really carried out. And the whole long history of Israel, even though this was a proscription of a prescription of the law, there's no real evidence that it actually ever happened. Such is human nature. Such it is with us that once we grab onto something, it's very hard for us to let it go. Even if it means that doing so brings favor from God. But you know, it's not enough simply to understand why Jesus got in trouble by saying these things. Because you know, whenever one of us was carried over to that font and baptized in the waters of baptism, whether it was here in this church or in another place, as St. Paul says, we were joined to the body of Christ. We became part of Christ. And in fact, that anointing business is carried out in that same ceremony where at the end, we almost don't notice it because everybody's focused on the water of the baptism, that the priest takes holy chrism, our abiding sacramental sign of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our midst, and anoints the top of the head and says, you are marked out as Christ's own. You have been anointed in the same way. Which means then this mission of Jesus that he describes here is not only to Jesus of Nazareth, but it is our mission, our responsibility, our obligation as well to proclaim good news to the poor, to liberate captives, to set prisoners free from their debts, and to bring sight to the blind, not only the people who are blind in their physical bodies, but those who are inwardly blind, who can't see for the life of them. We have these phrases in our language. He can't see it. It's as plain as the nose on his face. We use that, those kinds of words all the time. We don't mean that they're physically blind but they are inwardly blind in the heart and in the mind. And that's what Jesus came to do, to open our eyes to the truth so that then we who are joined to him would become his agents. We would become the ones also anointed of the Spirit so that we proclaim this same message. Very heady stuff. Very hard to hear. 
when we begin to realize that this is a story not only about Jesus, but about you, about all of us, then suddenly we begin to realize both our very high calling, but the deep responsibility we bear for the world. That Jesus came not just for those who love him, he came for the ones that would kill him. Brothers and sisters, we are called to proclaim this year of favor. Yes, you heard this, this particular passage frequently in this parish. Every October, we move the Feast of St. Luke to a Sunday so that we can all celebrate it, but it's more than just simply a happy celebration here in church and a great meal afterwards. It's to hear this particular passage which is read every time at the Feast of St. Luke. And if we are truly followers of St. Luke's Gospel, this is our commission. This is our duty, our obligation, our responsibility. And that's why we read it year after year after year to remind ourselves of our high calling. So it is. All of us will say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For the Spirit has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to set captives free, to give sight to the blind, to declare the Lord's jubilee year. All of us. Let us not fail. Ever. This anointing is ours because we have been baptized into Christ Jesus. Let us stand then and profess that baptismal faith as together we say, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things are made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our presiding bishop, Michael, and our bishop, Kevin, for this gathering, and for myself and Mary, who are priests in this parish, and for all the ministers of God's people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. 
We pray for Hong Kong, Sheng Kong Hui, for St. Andrews and Allentown, and the Diocesan Council of Bethlehem, the Diocese of Kajokeji and their Bishop Emmanuel Murray, and St. John Kim and St. John Kindiri parishes. Pray for justice and peace. I bid your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble, especially Joan, Barbara, Rosemary, Bud, Pat, Joyce, Bernice, Chris, and Abby. Pray for the people of God. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they might find him and be found by him. Pray for the world. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. We pray this day for those in our parish, Leonid, Anne, Antonio, and Leoni, James, and Karen, and Linda, and especially for this congregation. Pray that we may have the grace we need to glorify Christ in our own day. Heavenly Father, our needs are many, and yet we need your strength to accomplish what you have set before us. Send your Holy Spirit to us now, fill our hearts and minds with your light, that we may be true disciples of Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. And now, my friends, let us together confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name, Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you all unto eternal life. Amen. So my friends, May the peace of the Lord be with you always. So walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself as an offering ever pleasing to God, our almighty Father.
For all things come of thee, O God. And of thine own we have given thee. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Because in the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine on in our hearts to give the knowledge of your glory in the very face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your holy people, in your word spoken to the prophets, but above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior, the Redeemer of the world. In him, you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him, you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. Now on the night before he died for us, our Lord Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after the supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and he said, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And so we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread this wine. We pray you, gracious God, now to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and the blood of his new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be made acceptable through him, having been sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And then, in the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us all to that heavenly country where with Mary, Luke, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, all through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, 
forever and ever. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. For the gifts of God are now given for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Faithful God, in the wonder of your wisdom and love, you fed your people in the wilderness with the bread of angels, and you sent Jesus to be the bread of life. We thank you for feeding us with this bread. May it strengthen us that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may embody your desire and be renewed for your service. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. May the true light come to shine upon you. May the Son sent by God be your guide and your strength. May you live in peace and hope as you grow in wisdom and faith. And so may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come upon you now and be with you forevermore. Amen. My friends, go in peace to love and to serve the Lord.